prevent that bowel infarction because otherwise they're straight for the OR and then they'll have the rigid board abdomen and you don't want to see that. Have you guys seen rigid board abdomens? I mean, it's important. You need to recognize that the belly is like, it's like you could bounce a quarter and it'll fly up higher. Um, so again, we can have a whole lecture on PAN, but testicular pain, abdominal pain, no lung involvement, interesting. Um, rashes, association with hepatitis B, as opposed to other hepatitis or HIV. Hepatitis B, this is, I guess, a board question. Basically, they'll present a guy and they'll say, IV drug abuser has, um, here, his classic. An IV drug abuser who's um, from the Far East shows up and um, he, he presents to your office with foot drop. What's the most likely diagnosis? Well, the foot drop you're supposed to know is mononeuritis multiplex, and you're supposed to know it's supposed to, you're supposed to know that the IV drug user got Hep B from needles, and um, therefore you have to make that connection. Okay, so mononeuritis multiplex is an isolation of a named nerve. So um, foot drop is a paralysis um, of the perineal nerve. Uh, radial nerve is wrist drop. Uh, ulnar nerve is claw hand. Um, so if you can name the nerve, that would be a you know medium or large nerve. If you can't name it, then you're in the small fiber neuropathy, and that's in the skin. That's where you need a skin biopsy to measure the small fiber of the nerve. Okay, so that's a little thing about PAN, but I need you to know, oh, so to diagnose, often renal artery. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this. You, you don't want to overlook the renal arteries, and also it can present not only with mononeuritis multiplex, can present with uncontrolled hypertension in somebody on six or eight hypertension drugs. So if you get renal artery vasculitis, you should be thinking, yes, it could be ankylvasculitis, or it could be some residual from one of the large vessel diseases, but wait, I really have to think about PAN. And, you know, what do you do? You, you have to do an angiogram or a CTA. You have to do it fast. Because otherwise, you can give them all the blood pressure drug in the world. It doesn't matter. They need steroids to, to open up their renal arteries. Okay. Um, so if you know those presentations, that uncontrolled hypertension and mononeuritis multiplex in an IV drug user, I mean, and by the way, I remember the board questions really well, even from years ago and from research in, in both medicine and room, but the medicine questions, they would definitely ask you that type of question. Okay. Um, all right, now, so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but I'm going to try and, try and make it so that you can understand it. Small vessel vasculitis is all over the hospital, even right now. Um, somebody in this hospital, if not 20 people in this hospital, or 10%, probably have some small, some small vessel vasculitis. So I'm going to tell you real quick, there's primary and there's secondary small vessel vasculitis. The primary category, the most common by far, is a drug reaction to sulfur or hydrochlorothiazide or something like that. So you walk into a patient's room, and Monday they were fine, and Tuesday they have this rash on their feet or legs, and it looks like palpable purpura, and you're thinking, God, does everyone have henoctronline purpura, now known as IgA vasculitis? No, 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 no. Check their med list. If they're on anything to do with sulfur, stop it. Whether it's a diabetic drug, whether it's hydrochlorothiazide, whatever, you've just discovered they have a sulfa allergy. It's common with Celebrex, it's common with so many of these drugs. Because it doesn't have to be purely sulfa, it could be one of the sulfa moieties that are different from drug to drug. So a person could be allergic to Celebrex and not allergic to other sulfa products. Um, but again, the rash looks the same. It always looks the same. You get it better with steroids, but you have to get rid of the offending thing. So please know that. Now, the other primary small vessel vasculitis um, and I'll try to make it board related. So cryoglobulinemia, why do you have to know about this? Well, it'll be on the boards because they'll say, gee, there's an IV drug abuser from Southeast Asia who has um, a crazy purple rash all over his legs and there's dots and spots and this and that, but there's no ulcers. So you're like, okay, there's no ulcers, so it's probably small vessel disease and the guy's an IV drug user. Wait a minute, hepatitis C is associated with cryoglobulinemia. So there you go. So you got another good association for the boards, and now you know that another cause of primary small vessel vasculitis are cryoglobulins. Not hepatitis C, but cryoglobulins. Um, 
Uh, okay, then you've got hypocomplementemic or urticarial vasculitis, low complements um, with hives chronically. Some of this overlaps with allergy immunology, but generally speaking, it's not a hard diagnosis. You do a skin biopsy, you see vasculitis, and you see urticaria, and um, you treat them. Uh, we don't have time to go through all the treatments. Um, I don't want to leave out, um, so I, I did mention IG, IgA4, which is, I'm sorry, I, I, okay, I'm rushing too much. I mentioned IgA vasculitis, which was formerly called Hinochstrom line purpura. Please know about that disease. Please know the five components of that disease. Monoarthritis, severe abdominal pain, non-thrombocytopenic purpura, i.e. palpable purpura, normal platelets. Um, uh, there's something else, oh, renal failure. If adults, if children get the disease, and by the way, the disease usually comes after a respiratory infection. If children get it, it goes away aimlessly. If adults get it, then you're dealing with a lifetime of rituxan and you hope they get better. And we use cytoxan and we plasmapheresis and everything that's available, we try what we need to for the kidney failure. And then the, the one thing I have to talk about is ankyvasculitis, because this goes both that you guys need to know what the terms mean, you know, you need to know what the blood tests are, and what the associations are, and when do you order the test, and, and what do the values mean? So whenever you're gonna order a blood test, you need to know what is the pretest probability. It, like, if you're gonna draw my anchor right now, for no reason, and my anchor comes out positive, and, and you say to me, all right, listen, you, your anchor's really high, we have to admit you to the ICU. Why, I feel fine. Well, your blood says, I don't ever wanna hear that. You don't treat blood tests. You, you must know what is your pretest probability. Now, on the other hand, if I walk in and I'm coughing up blood and I'm urinating blood or, or I'm bloated and, and um, I have uh, anasarca and my eyes are bulging out and I have a severe headache and I have um, whatever else you can think wrong, wow, this guy might have vasculitis. He's got a rash or he doesn't have a rash. His joints are swollen. He's got arthritis. Remember, I always go back to the joints can be involved in anything that a rheumatologist sees, no exceptions. Um, so, you suspect vasculitis and you check serum IgA, cryoglobulins, you look at the drug list, blah, blah, blah. Don't forget to order your anchor, the anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. Why is that important? Well, it's important because when you subdivide it, there's the MPO, which is the myeloperoxidase antibody, and there's the PR3. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of cat got my tongue moment. But the myeloperoxidase antibody is um, associated with renal limited vasculitis. It's associated with, and this is the big one, microscopic polyangiitis. So microscopic polyangiitis It'll, it'll present sort of like PAN, except there's lung involvement. So pulmonary renal syndrome, which when I say pulmonary renal syndrome, I'm talking about somebody with alveolar hemorrhages along with glomerulonephritis. And what makes the ANCA diseases unique is unlike lupus, which has immune deposits, or unlike uh, IgA disease, which has IgA deposits, there are no deposits, it's POSI immune. So if you read a report from pathology and it says POSI immune glomerulonephritis, you're probably dealing with an ankyvasculitis. I mean, it's certainly high on the list. Now the PR3 antibody, oh, the protonase 3, I just, I couldn't think of the word. The protonase 3 antibody is essentially synonymous with uh, what we used to call Wegener's granulomatosis. So there's no, like, there's no more Hanoxone and purple. You guys missed the boat. And now there's no Wegners. They're taking away all the diseases. This is really terrible. You can go to IHOP and get a pancake, but you can't get a disease. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so what was formerly known as uh, um, Wegners is, is now known as um, um, PR3, protonase 3 ankyvasculitis. And um, so, frequently present with three things, the important things to know. Upper respiratory, 
lower respiratory and renal. Now, that being said, I've seen it present with arthritis. I've seen it present with rash. So if you see a rash that is not psoriasis, it's not a bug bite, you have to biopsy it. Now, if you're in an institution where it's impossible to get a dermatologist, I suggest you find your most aggressive resident and start teaching them how to do skin biopsies and get this stuff to the lab because otherwise you're missing so many diseases or they're being shipped to other hospitals and you don't need that because they're easy diagnosis to make and they're even easier to treat. And I always tell people, you don't really need to know how to treat anything, but you have to diagnose it and then you can look up the treatment. It takes two seconds to look up these days a treatment if you don't know something. I mean, you guys can look it up faster than I can. I don't even know how to use the slides stuff. So again, nasal crusting, nosebleeds, chronic sinus, recurrent sinus infections, chronic pneumonias, recurrent pneumonias, recurrent pulmonary infiltrates. This isn't normal. If somebody tells you they were admitted to the hospital five times in the last two years for pneumonia, immediately they weren't. They are misdiagnosed. Somebody missed the fact that they have another disease. Now we're talking about vasculitis, so in this case it would be vasculitis. It could have been, it could have been anything. So I'll stretch it. If it's abdominal pain, and maybe with a fever, that could be vasculitis, and you could see um, the bowel edema, or you could have a bowel infarction, but I'll throw out one thing for you because it's becoming a big topic. Autoinflammatory diseases or, or periodic fever syndromes. Just real quick, recurrent um, rashes that look like erysipelas, recurrent abdominal pain that mimics serositis, or that could be serositis, or is serositis, uh, and recurrent fevers. Now, you don't have to have all three of these. Oh, and, and arthritis. Again, always arthritis. Recurrent joint swelling that makes no sense. So, rheumatoid and uh, psoriatic and the chronic arthritis, they're gonna have chronic synovial swelling and thickening until you treat the disease. These other diseases sound like gout if you don't know what you're looking for. Okay. Um, so real quick, I'll go down the rest of the list. Um, burgers is, uh, so we're down to our last five minutes, okay? So now, listen, we're gonna go into our two minute drill, all right? I swear to God, I'm gonna get my best receivers and uh, we're, we're gonna get the two point conversion here. Um, this is nothing else, I am gonna finish out this slide. You need to know for the boards and because I'm telling you, somebody comes out of a cardiac procedure with blue feet, they have cholesterol emboli syndrome. The cholesterol emboli syndrome presents like vasculitis, high sed rate, high eosinophils, but it's cholesterol emboli. So it's not, oh, we'll just give them some prednisone and they'll go home. No, you have to call the surgeon and find where the cholesterol is coming from. Um, calciphylaxis, about a year ago, I wrote a case report here at the hospital of non-uremic calciphylaxis. Calciphylaxis, resembles vasculitis, you get these big, horrific, uh, uh, ulcerated areas. And sometimes you can actually visually see the calcium. Because the calcium, phosph calcium phosphorus, uh, phosphate product is typically more than about 72. And of course that's normally in, in renal patients. My patient that I had here at this hospital uh, that I wrote up and it's in the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology, that patient um, was a diabetic who I, I don't even think their calcium phosphor, phosphorus, uh, phosphate product was off the wall. But nonetheless, on biopsy, they had calciphylaxis. Um, okay, the medium vessel disease, PAN, can present in a small vessel fashion. Crohn's and sarcoid can present with arthritis. They can present with vasculitis. Um, the only difference in the pathology, you're gonna see granulomas. It's very hard to differentiate sarcoid and Crohn's. Um, ASCA antibodies are seen in Crohn's, typically the IgA version of this antibody. So the ASCA uh, IgA is highly elevated in a Crohn's patient while it won't be in a sarcoid patient. Sarcoid patient, you're looking at a gallium scan, you want to look for lymph nodes and, and so on. Um, we don't see a lot of, well, you know what, I shouldn't say this. I, I pick up another case of latent TB almost every week when I screen for biologic therapy. So there is TB out there. Um, so 
the autoimmune diseases quickly would be RA, lupus, Sjogren's, scleroderma, myositis. Um, I wanted to mention that gout is associated with arthritis, nodules, topus, uh, cardiac valve involvement, renal failure from uh, clogging up the tubules, um, renal stone disease, and it comes in acute attacks, as you're all aware of. By the way, acute attacks, a rheumatologist, Forget taking the boards. A rheumatologist will just come along and stick a needle in the joint and that's the end of the attack and the patient goes home. There's no need for a five day hospitalization for antibiotics on a gout attack, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but for the board exam, you have to give NSAIDs. Um, and also, for the board exam, the only way to prove gout is um, see crystals in the fluid. Oh, and I have, well, somewhere <laughs> there's, I think I have some pictures actually, I'll show you. So you must see crystals, okay? Um, you cannot diagnose it by officially by ultrasound because if you have ultrasound, you can have MSU and CPPD, or you can have MSU and you can have infection, and you won't know just because they have the crescent sign, which is the ultrasound finding in gout, you're not going to prove that that acute attack is from that finding. With the crystals, if it's in a white blood cell being phagocytosed, then you have proof that that actual attack is from the um, gout. Okay. Um, now, don't ever call me and say the guy has osteo, because I'm going to say, osteo what? So th this is a short list, okay? Um, whoever made the slide spelled osteomalacia wrong, but anyway, osteoporosis, osteo uh, osteoporosis, you guys know what it is, osteopetrosis, petrus is rock, so it's, it's increased bone density. Osteomalacia is lack of the osteoid seam, no vitamin D, no phosphate, nothing. Osteonecrosis, uh, osteosarcoma, uh, osteoclast and blast when it comes to osteoporosis uh, bone remodeling, and then I put at the end, osteo-anything. So again, if you want to like really piss me off, you'll tell me, hey, I want you to see a patient with osteo. I'll be like, are you out of your mind? You gotta learn something and call me back because osteo means nothing. It's like telling me, go see uh, Dr. S uh, Dr. Smith. There's 4, 400 million Dr. Smiths, which one? Okay. Um, we treat what is titled hereditary D disorder of connective tissue, the most common Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, okay? The truth of the matter is, this is the most common thing we see, and it's the most common disease probably on the planet that at least pertains to this field. 20-25% of the patients, whether they have mitral valve prolapse, they get stretchy skin, they get nearsighted, easy bruising, but again, joint pain, the joints move too much, the ligaments are lax, they, they sprain their ankle, they dislocate the kneecap, etc. Okay, I'm, I know I'm running low on time. And just for what it's worth, if, you, if, if on the board exam, if they have blue sclera, that's osteogenesis imperfecta with hypermobility. If they have a chicken skin neck and loose bones, that's pseudoxanthoma elasticum. They also get angioid streaks. That's a word for the boards, angioid streaks. Um, sticklers. I know, you, you know all this stuff, I know that. Um, <laughs> sticklers, sensory neuronal hearing loss with uh, cleft lip and cleft palate. Hypermobile, that's sticklers. Oh, I see you behind that mask, you think you know that too. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and Marfan's, uh, that's the Abe Lincoln. Really, it, it's, it's more, they're, they're all the same, really. They just all have a different phenotype. So the one thing to know about Marfan's, Dislocated lens and aortic valve. Um, hold on. Membranes. I just wanted to mention that we get ulcerations and vasculitic lesions in places that you just have to look. Genitals. If you're leaving out the genital exam on somebody who's sick, you're not doing the patient a favor. Now, I'm not one of these people that says, like, when I, when I was a resident, you have to do a rectal exam on everybody unless there's no finger or no asshole. That's the only reason to not do a rectal exam. I don't know what goes on today in hospitals, but I don't do rectal exams too much anymore, if ever. But if you don't, you're in trouble. But if you don't do a genital exam on somebody who's chronically ill, that's like saying, you know, I listen to their heart and lungs, they're fine. Well, you miss the, you miss the skin lesion between their fingers, you miss the nail infarct, you miss the splinter hemorrhages, you miss the penile ulcer, you miss the rectal ulcer, and how did you tell me you examine them? Where does psoriasis hide? In the rectal cleft. So if you don't look, if somebody comes in with swollen elbow, swollen knee, you better check their butt to look for psoriasis. Um, polychondritis, you don't need to know about. Okay, 
Um, so I just wanted to tell you about inflamed versus uninflamed fluid, right? You drain fluid out of a joint. If the cell count is more than 2,000, by convention, it's called inflammatory. And if it's under 2,000, it's, it's called non-inflammatory. How much time do I have left? Seven minutes. Seven? No, I just want to know if I have to stop or if I can keep going. Uh, you have a couple of more minutes. Okay, okay. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize uh, for you. You need to understand that, again, let's say there's a guy in the hospital who's here for pneumonia. And he says to you, hey doc, my, um, my knee hurts. Okay, fine. So you call your rheumatologist, he drains the knee. The fluid comes out and it's clear like water. That's normal fluid. That shouldn't happen because he wouldn't be having pain if he had normal fluid. But um, the fluid will be aspirated and like I will take it to my office, I'll take it under the polarizing scope, I'll look for crystals. And the common crystals I'll see would be um, MSU, which is gout, or CPPD, which is pseudogout, or calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. Um, I often see cholesterol plates, which are a sign of chronic bursa effusions. Um, you want to know the cell count. What's the white cell count of the fluid? That's what you need to know. If it's over 2,000, they're inflamed. So inflamed includes rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren, scleroderma, myopathy, IgG4-related disease, hepatitis A, B, C, HIV, Lyme, infectious endocarditis, any virus, even COVID, um, gout. Uh, by the way, gout fluid can be non-inflammatory non or inflammatory. It really just depends. The same for the, all these crystals. So there's calcium pyrophosphate crystals, hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is the shoulder uh, is when you get a calcification on the rotator cuff. That's appetite. Uh, oxalate is something you, you see in dialysis patients rarely. You don't see it much anymore. Um, Bichette's relapsing polychondritis. I didn't put adult onset stills disease, but that's another big one for, auto, um, uh, for inflammatory joint fluid. Um, and by the way, tomorrow's lecture is all about the blood test, so we can have a lot of redundancy and I don't have to rush so much. Oh, I, I put adult stills. Now, I put celiac there because 70% of celiac patients have um, um, sacroiliac disease. That's one thing I didn't mention today, is sacroiliac disease. Crohn's, psoriasis, ankylosing, spondylitis, reactive arthritis. Again, they look like they're lined up as spondyloarthropathies. They are. So the joint fluid in those people, it's always going to be inflammatory. Now, you might say to me, if a cell count is 1,500, they're still inflamed, right? Yes, they are. But by convention, osteoarthritis, it's acceptable to go up to 2,000. Which is why there's now many theories that there is an inflammatory component to osteoarthritis because the cell count isn't zero. Because once there's white cells, there is some inflammation going on. Um, let's see. Okay, so the non-inflammatory, man, this is great. There's so few to talk about, this is easy. So. For the boards, here's what I want you to know for the boards. I want you to know for the boards that if they tell you, and they will never say hemoarthrosis, they're gonna say the cell count in the synovial fluid has um, billions of red cells and no white cells, something like that they'll tell you. And you basically have to do the calculation in your head. You have to say, okay, wait a minute. The normal white count is five million, um, um, yeah, uh, 5 million and then, um, um, and then the, um, the, the um, cell count would be 5,000, so I do the factor and I divide it and make sure that they line up so that it's, you know, a real tap and, as opposed to a tra If it's exactly the way it's supposed to be, it's a traumatic tap. If it's a hemoarthrosis, it's just going to be red cells. So scurvy. So when, when the question comes, they're going to ask you, which of the following is the cause of the patient's knee fluid? Vitamin B, B1, B6, B12, vitamin D, or vitamin C? It's vitamin C. Okay. So, uh, so hemoarthrosis, and by the way, the importance of hemoarthrosis, blood is phlogistic. Phlogistic means blood incites inflammation. So even if you have a sprained ankle with a hemoarthrosis, you need to drain it. It doesn't need surgery immediately. And even if it's a, an avulsion fracture, it needs an air cast. 
So you come to me, I drain it, I stick in some steroid to uninflame it, and then let the orthopedic guy deal with the, the injury. But now it'll heal better because it's uninflamed. Um, works better than ice pack. And also the non-inflammatory osteoarthritis and CPPD. CPPD again, and let, let's go over this real quick. Calcium pyrophosphate deposition is just what it says. It's the deposition of calcium uh, pyrophosphate. So when you, you cannot tell me on an x-ray they have pseudo gout. That's impossible, okay? All you can say is if a person with chondrocalcinosis or calcified cartilage in their knees has a big knee effusion and you drain it and you look at the fluid in the microscope and you see calcium pyrophosphate crystals, you can say that's acute pseudo gout. However, if they have it in their hands and the knuckles are all swollen in the MCPs, you can say, oh, that's associated with, you have the contracalcinosis there, that's, a, that's pseudo rheumatoid arthritis. So that, that's how you have to think about it, okay? So the x-ray finding is called chondrocalcinosis. Pseudo gout is a mimic of gout, except it's not gout. Pseudo RA is a mimic. So please keep the terms separate. Because by calling a rheumatologist and saying, hey, you know, I checked the x-rays and the guy has pseudo gout. Like, are you stupid? That, that, that can't work. So it's very good to be a purist. You need to know the vocabulary. You need to know the language, you know, to, to communicate properly. Um, okay. I, I only showed this slide because I, I was talking at the beginning about the size of the joints. So these are small joints, uh, large joint, large joint, small joints. Uh, for whatever reason, the, the wrist is classified as a medium joint. The elbow, I think, is a medium joint, and the shoulders are large joints. The sternoclavicular joints, again, when you're examining somebody, look and touch their sternoclavicular joints as part of the shoulder exam. The arthritic patients, the diseases don't read books. They don't spare the sternoclavicular joints. And if you see a lump here, no, they're not always dislocated. They can have an effusion in the acromioclavicular joint as well, which is this one here. These are the TMJs. The cervical spine is involved in RA. It's involved in psoriatic arthritis in an inflammatory pattern. In the lumbar spine, there's no involvement in rheumatoid arthritis. None. If you've got lumbar involvement and you think it's RA, you're wrong. So if your treatment isn't working out, it's either a wrong, um, wrong diagnosis or wrong medicine. So this is when you take a step back, you say, wait a minute, I swear the guy has RA, but he's got this back problem. Well then fine, he has a separate back problem, so you gotta address it separately. Maybe he's got OA, maybe he got injury, maybe he got osteoporosis, fracture, maybe the back pain is referred from aortic aneurysm or posterior penetrating ulcer or, or pancreatitis or something, you know. So please try to keep things separate in your mind. And, and yes, you should try to be a lump or not a splitter, but sometimes know that if it's the DIP involved, it's not RA. It's, it's OA with a cyst or it's tophaceous gout with, o, with RA. In a cohort of 600 of my patients, 1.8% um, had both uh, concurrent tophaceous gout and uh, RA. So many years ago, RA was treated with high dose aspirin. And because of the high dose aspirin lowering uric acid, RA patients that were treated that way never got gout. But we, we don't use aspirin, we don't really use NSAIDs anymore. So we don't have people with low uric acids from these drugs. So many people have concurrent uh, gout and RA. So any myth that they don't coexist is, has been um, squashed. Um, I don't know, been, oh, I wanted to show you the crystals and that's it. Wow. Oh, you know what? Um, this is a book entitled Soft Tissue Rheumatic Pain. It basically goes over everything I said at the beginning, how I said we treat trigger pain. By the way, I hold a patent for the needle that um, uh, uh, gets rid of trigger fingers. Nobody can do it better than I can, nobody. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. Same for carpal tunnel, again. So soft tissue rheumatism refers to, and by the way, I put this up here because this is a rheumatology textbook. This is not an orthopedic or pain management textbook. Guys, you getting the point here? Tennis elbow, golfer's elbow. Rotator cuff tendonitis, carpal tunnel, which if you want to find the median nerve, it's under the palmaris longus, right? You guys knew that. Um, 
the trigger finger, it's usually flexor tendonitis. You often have a nodule there, like a little ganglion or some nodule. Um, any of these things fall into soft tissue rheumatism. Even pain up here, oh, you need a trigger point injection. You know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but, you know. Okay, so guys, we're going to wrap up for today. I'm out of time. And um, I think the crystals might be in tomorrow's uh, group of slides. And um, if, if I have time, I'll answer a question. Okay, since everyone knows everything, I guess there's no questions. <laughs> that was very helpful. Yeah. Thank you.